into that all-important uh, matter when it comes to happenings in Idra in recent times, the, the tension, uh, the security situation. And joining the conversation, we have Professor Kwesi Enning. Uh, he's a security analyst and he is with the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping uh, Training uh, Center. Hopefully later we shall also have security analyst Emmanuel Bombandi join the conversation. But a very good morning to you, Professor Enning. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Prof, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but your voice is a little low. Okay, let, let, let me try this. Is, is it better now? Is it... Yes, it's better, better, yeah. Great, great. Uh, thank you once more for making the time. So what is your initial reaction, your commencing thoughts on uh, the happenings so far when it comes to... Uh, the death of Ibrahim Mohammed alias Kaka, and now what we know uh, as transpired yesterday with this onslaught. What is your initial reaction? Well, of course, uh, I think that lives have been lost. I'm not taken aback, and this will not be the last time. I think uh, last week you and I had a conversation when I was the call of the policy. Intelligence gathering and Prof, the, 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 the connection seems just a little... Yeah, uh, okay, is it better? It, it is, it is better. Yeah. Did, did I hear you say that this is not going to be the last time? Uh, can you just re oh, what you it, said? It certainly is not going to be the last. I mean, I think last week when we spoke, I made the same statement that in terms of the quality of the intelligence that had suddenly resulted in 225 people being rounded up with respect to the police officer who had been murdered and the other lady. I, I thought that was bad intelligence and poor analysis. So mm. I thought violence, societal violence would continue. So yes, it's unfortunate we are losing lives, but it doesn't come as a surprise to me and it will not end because we are looking at these things in a totally wrong way. You say we are looking at it in a totally uh, wrong way. Yeah. Why, why do you feel that exactly? Right. Well, could you, if we take the uh, Adria case, after Kaka died, there was a desperate cry from the community for empathy, for understanding, for somebody to send a signal that look, we care about your suffering, we've heard you, and we want to do something about it. About 10 days ago, you and I had another conversation in which we were told that there was no insecurity in the country. I think the police spokesperson waxed lyrical about how there shouldn't be any usage of the word insecurity. And I had argued strongly that the first step of understanding the social tensions and the pools and the strains is to listen to the language of the people that we serve. So once more in Adria, when people called for understanding, for a listening ear, for somebody to say, yes, we care. The police did not show that leadership. The officer from the National Intelligence Bureau, I don't know the quality of the analysis and the report he sent to his or to her superiors, but we failed to capture the moment of frustration, of anger, of a sense of exclusion and denial of protection. Mm. And it is that failure that led to an assessment of the situation that was totally wrong and created an idea or a perception that there was a raging mob armed, and who needed to be faced, not by the police, but by the military. 
let me try to explain. So, 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 so even as you explain, Prof, so was that a wrong move in the first place, getting the military involved, even as you, 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 you expatiate that was further? A move that ought not to have taken place mm. at that stage. The military only comes in when the sanctity of a community or a state is at stake. The police have been overwhelmed and there are forces incapable of responding. Then you bring the military in with one purpose, to defeat the enemy and to establish control. Now, Kudo, there are multiple levels of failure from the side of the Ghana Police Service. This morning, I think on your news report, I heard they had brought in reinforcements. Reinforcements to do what? When there is calm? Mm. If they had listened to the voices of the people when Kaka died, and they had brought in reinforcements, backed by the formed police unit, then they could have stood aside because they are trained to control crowds and then to control demonstrations. The police mm. are trained to do that. Mm. And they have graduated force, mm. normally the use of water cannon and tear gas, and hardly ever use guns for the control of crowds. So somewhere, somehow, whoever took the decision either did not understand how to take those decisions, that there was a deliberate manipulative attempt to provide assessment that did not speak to the actual situation on the ground. And that has led to this unfortunate situation that the international media has picked up. And it's causing us supreme reputational damage. Supreme reputational damage, you say. Uh, just before we uh, continue, just to... Uh, uh, this is Benjamin you're speaking to, actually. I know because you've been oh, okay. uh, shuffling between radio and television, sometimes it gets confusing, but this is oh, Benjamin. And, uh, and as an old man, you know, sometimes one gets a bit confused. <laughs> I understand. Me. I understand. But, yeah. but so that means we, we got it completely uh, wrong. But what would you say then? Uh, today you're talking about, you know more officers pouring in and all of that, reinforcement and all of that. How do you feel in the immediate term we can be easing the tension in Idra and even some of what we are seeing spill over in other parts of the country where people are pouring their emotions on social media and all of that? In the interim, even before we go to the core issues, the, the, the narrative, what happened yesterday, what do you think we, we ought to be looking at? Well, I think it would be good in any other jurisdiction Mm. A couple of ministers responsible for what happened yesterday mm. would, would have been on the ground to say, we sympathize with, with you. Mm. This ought not to have happened. Mm. Please, let's dialogue. Let's bring this to an end. What are the problems? What are your needs? Mm. How do you think we can stretch out a hand in an empathetic manner because we are all Ghanaians, mm. we are all benefiting from the peace. Mm. Today must not end without some delegation of sorts mm. going to Israel to sympathize. But there must be a deliberative uh, effort. Now, it's interesting, since you're talking about leadership, and you can see, uh, for those watching on television, you can even see some of the scenes there, one of those uh, who, who, who had been uh, hit, supposedly being carried away. But... The Interior Minister, Ambrose Derry, has come out to say that, look, when this Fix the Country thing started, because we couldn't, we didn't want protesters to hit the streets uh, and demonstrate, we offered an opportunity for the leaders to come and engage top guns in government. The meeting was inconclusive. They said that the leadership of the Fix the Country uh, group said that they had to consult members before they could uh, come back. And he also, uh, you know, says on the back of what happened yesterday, and I'm quoting him here, uh, Professor Edding. He says, we want to know who did the beating. We want to know who attacked the person. What is this thing about the government? Is it the MPP? And you can add, who killed him? 
So from that standpoint, looking at this deliberation that you're speaking of, do you feel that is honestly going to happen? I mean, and if it doesn't, what, what could be the repercussions? Well, look, it must happen. I mean, I also heard the minister yesterday say, look, that those who perpetrated the initial murder, the beatings and the subsequent murder uh, or death were criminals, and that he was desperate and interested in getting those criminals arrested because otherwise they could attack him the next time. And I took a bit of solace in that personalization of the crime and his fear of what can happen. Mm. And I'm hoping that it will be followed up by a delegation going to Adria and having a conversation. Mm. Because, you see, when people feel desperate, when they feel let down, when they are frightened, they want their leaders to show empathy. They want to get a sense that we've not been left alone. So it's good optics and good operational intervention for people to go there and have this conversation. Mm. We, we shall and get if to... you start to mm. do that, okay. will lead to a sense of being abandoned. And that abandonment, that lacuna that arises from feeling that, oh, the state does not truly care about my head and my insecurity. That lacuna can be filled. I think in the last couple of weeks, we've heard about a possible infiltration into this country by terrorists from, from, the, from, from our neighboring states. Right. You know, so it's important that we don't get people's sense of, of abandonment <clears throat> to, be, to be capitalized upon. And those who are creating havoc <clears throat> around our neighbor, our neighboring states, you know, thrive on such circumstances, coming with a discourse and a narrative that is dialogic, that is consensual, that seeks to opportunistically exploit people's heads. So please, if people have not thought about it, let me use this medium to appeal that a delegation goes at least to sympathize and to show empathy. Mm. That makes people feel that, look, we are part of a whole, that somebody somewhere does care. I think the alternative is frightening to contemplate. The alternative is frightening to contemplate. I've heard you say that uh, what happened in Nigeria is only a symbolic representation of the frustration uh, across this country. Does that mean that we are, we are at the tipping point, some boiling point when it comes to you know, what is happening? You know, people wanting to vent, uh, give vents to their, their frustrations and not being allowed to do so, so to speak. Are we at tipping point? You know, tipping points are difficult to pinpoint. What is it that would make people flip over? In Nigeria, it was, you know, a carcass case. But it's important that, and herein comes my point about the quality of intelligence gathering and analysis, mm. that the NIB and its officials at the rural and urban areas must now begin to, to listen begin to join the dots of seemingly in course statements, of activities, of gatherings, that on the surface may not be problematic. Mm. Okay? But when we join the dots and through network analysis and evaluation, can then begin to see patterns emerging. And I think it's not difficult at all. Although people are gallivanting, promising courses on intelligence where they don't know <laughs> anything about in, in intelligence. It's just become a business. You know, so let's not deceive ourselves into thinking, well, a drought is calm, and therefore the structural conditions 
that have contributed to Edra cannot, cannot be found elsewhere. But then, we also need to go back to the drawing table and ask ourselves how the decisions were made leading to what happened yesterday. Mm. You see, in conflict resolution, when people are upset, and have identified an individual who has authority or power as being a part of the problem, then that same person cannot be part of the solution because there's, there, there isn't enough trust. Mm. So if the MC who had been allegedly accused of being part of the problem also chairs the MUSEC or the MISEC, that is the Metropolitan Security Council meeting, and make decisions about the deployment of troops, then that is improper. So, so what, what is your proposal? It, with immediate effect, that, that, that ought to be reversed? Well, I mean, the decision has been made, and we've seen the unfortunate, uh, unfortunate outcomes. Mm. You know, but I think... Now, Accra would need to provide some directions for the regional minister. Yes, I was, I was speaking in, in respect of, you know, the MCE, that henceforth that should be curtailed, even as, you know, those powers as far as uh, the, the security apparatus is concerned. Well, Does I mean, that if you have that... the deputy, then the deputy will have to take over mm. with guidance from the regional minister. That will begin the process of healing, and that will begin the process of reconciliation. L l l l were you about to say something, Prof? No. Okay. Uh, what the youth did, let let's analyze that. Uh, some have called it criminal. Some have said it warrants the actions. And others have said these were just young people uh, venting, giving vent to their emotions, their frustrations. So let's take a look at them. At a point, they were burning tires. At some point, we are told that some were wielding clubs or sticks, some threw stones, and even some per a police report, per that police report, supposedly well, were wielding firearms, supposedly. Would that justify, you've already gone back to the military getting involved, but uh, would that justify what happened? No. You know, when people demonstrate, and they demonstrated use of offensive weapons, the only thing that a uniformed forces can do mm is to use appropriate and corresponding force. But precisely because they are better trained and have a better assessment of the situation, then one does not expect them to use disproportionate force leading to the loss of life. But let me say this. I am quite happy with the manner in which there's been bipartisan criticism of the occurrences by parliament. I think that is, this is one of the finest moments for parliament, and I'm hoping that the, the Parliamentary Committee on Defense and, and Interior also will send um, um, a delegation to go and have this conversation, and also to listen firsthand to what took place and how the decisions were made. But under no circumstances is it justifiable that lives ought to have been lost in such a situation. The, the police establishment, and uh, you know, we all know it's part of the executive arm of government, the security apparatus is part of uh, government. Looking at some of these pockets of actions, do you feel they are unnecessarily courting the displeasure of the people uh, against this administration? L looking at all of these happenings, what, what is your take? Well, I think a professional performance of their duties actually benefits any government. It's when services are provided in an ineffective or ineffectual manner 
that of course citizens turn their frustration over and above the, the first respondent. Mm. So in this particular case, and I'm targeting the police and then the intelligence people who were on the ground, they filled their respective ministers and by extension created an unnecessary anger against political authority. You see, because if the police and NIB officers on the ground had captured the situation properly, given options for response, I doubt very much if a crash response would have been to say, send these soldiers, let them take firing position and shoot people in the back. That would never have happened. Mm. So somewhere, somehow, those on the ground that the state has entrusted power into their hands to protect people and by extension the state interest field. And in this particular case, it's the police service and the intelligence officer who's on the ground. Uh, two two uh, you know, issues uh, right before we, we wrap this conversation. The first one has to do with uh, Albert Kandapa, National Security Minister, who has been saying that there is too much political, you know, intolerance. And if I may just cite some of what he says, he's expressing worry over that intolerance. And he is saying that if the canker is not nipped in the bud, it could plunge the country into chaos in future. Well, he was saying it from a certain standpoint. But here we are looking at some of these pockets, these incidents that keep uh, happening, and especially in Adria, what we're seeing there. Uh, what do you forecast? I mean, could this, could this be the trigger on the back of Fix the Country, on the back of the Economic Fighters League? We hear Kaka, uh, as his alias was, uh, was a member of the Economic Fighters League. Could this be the trigger for other spillover events in other parts of the country? And what do we do to forestall those? Well, let me, you've mentioned the minister's name. Mm. I, I think if there's any one person who will be agonizing over uh, Adria, it will be Mr. Kandapa. Mm. And why do I say so? You know, when the national security strategy document was presented, the argument was that the document is predicated on two critical things. Respect for human rights, and the rule of law. Mm. The behavior of Azugu and what ha has happened yesterday and elsewhere shows that the minister's grand vision and dream, his optimistic dream of a service and the delivery of that service mm. that respects citizens' human rights and predicated on the rule of law is going to take a long time to achieve. Because those who should implement that strategy them, themselves don't seem to share the values and the principles and underpinning the national security strategy document. Now, our own leaders, our political leaders, do accept that issues of unemployment, the youth boards leading to limited law enforcement creates a toxic mix, a toxic brew, in which frustrations, a sense of exclusion and isolationism, and a desperation to be part of Ghana's success story can easily be turned into what we have seen in Adria. Uh, Mm. And Nigeria is only symptomatic of a broader, bigger challenge. So we need quick, proactive responses. First, that sends a signal of care, mm. that we have a duty of care, that what has happened is unfortunate. Those who made the decisions that led to the loss of lives, will be sanctioned, and the sanctioning will be made public. But we will also 
probe why this mistake took place, mm. and we will learn lessons from it. If so, lessons are not learned, mm. and people do not comply with the lessons, I'm afraid the groundswell of anger, frustration, uh, that we saw demonstrated in Nigeria, and that boldness to attack armored vehicles, I mean the, the vehicle with the water canal, that daringness and the need for the police to escape will escalate. And Ben, I'm talking about the need for stretching out our hand to calm things mm. because the signal of unarmed people, kids, youth, chasing an armored water cannon vehicle, mm. and that vehicle having to escape, I can imagine that it tells people or sends a message that the apparent invisibility has been broken. It can be broken. Prof, we need to reverse that and reverse it quickly. It, it's been insightful. We need to come together mm. as one mm. and to feel that we are part of a progressive Ghana that respects human rights mm. and that respects the rule of law. I was going to wade into your, your final you know, thoughts about what to do moving forward, but you've already expressed that in, in these uh, thoughts that you've shared. So that probe, uh, you know, engaging those affected, the people of Idra, especially the affected families, and more. And, of course, learning the lessons, uh, like you have said. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Professor Enning, for it's giving us pleasure. your time. Thank you very much. And uh, thank Sorry for giving you yet another name. <laughs> Maybe your middle name is uh, Kojo. So. <laughs> That is fine. Thank you so much, Prof, for engaging <laughs> us. And uh, that is Professor Enning, uh, Kwesi Enning, uh, who is with the Kofi Annan International Pre Peacekeeping Training Center and also a security analyst. A lot of food for thought that he's given us this morning. But uh, moving on from there, we're going to be discoursing on soccer, the Ghana uh, football awards uh, that we're going to have some thoughts shared on. It's coming off, but what are we to expect? That is up next on the AM Show. Do stay.